Fire. Welcome, everyone. It is 530, so I would like to welcome everyone to the City Council meeting. We are recording this, and it is available if you would like to join us virtually. There is a link. If you go to jeffersoncitymo.gov, you can click on the link on our agenda there. Or you can call in at 404-397-1516. The meeting number is 187-812-3361 and the meeting password is 1234. So all that is on our agenda on the city's website. So with that, I will call this work session to order. Mrs. Donaldson, roll call, please. Fitzwater. Present. Hensley. Kimna. Lester. Here. Schreiber. Here. Spencer. Here. Spicer. Present. Vote. Ward. Here. Weisman. Item three, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Item four, update on American Rescue Plan Act funding. Mr. Kroll. Thank you. I thought I would just briefly update on some of the information that we know about um, the uh, American Rescue Plan, which we call the Rescue Plan. Um, most of it I gave at the March 18th uh, Finance Committee meeting, so I just thought I'd highlight some of those uh, points and then um, we can try to answer any questions. I would say that um, staff is still attending a lot of educational sessions and training and um, we expect there to be a lot more to come, including additional guidance from Treasury. Um, I know Margie even had some uh, um, sessions she attended last week, and I attended one today. And um, there's just a lot of information that's coming out and still continues to come out to provide some more detail. But on uh, March 11th, President uh, Biden signed the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan Act and just for perspective, 57% of the funds are allocated to states and 35% to local governments. The city's designated to receive approximately $7,586,581 as an entitlement city, which means it's going to come directly to us. We don't have to apply for that funding through the state or any other entity. And the county will receive about $14.88 dollars We received our first tranche, our first allocation of money. Um, which I've sent that number to council of $3,793,290.50. And Margie made sure we got that 50 cents. And so that second tranche will need to, will expect to come um, no earlier than a year um, from the receipt of the first one. So we got the first allocation. There's another allocation coming, so probably about a year away. And during that time period, there's still a lot of guidance and information that's coming out. Uh, and specifics about not only the eligibility, but how um, to uh, account for some of those funds. Um, the cities and counties uh, can use the money too, and I'll just go over some of the uh, broad uh, perspective here, and there's a lot of detail, but to support public health expenditures, 
presumably all related to COVID, address negative economic impacts caused by the public health emergency, replace lost public sector revenue, provide premium pay for essential workers, um, offering additional support to those who have and will bear the greatest health impacts um, and risks because of their service and critical infrastructure sector, sectors. Although in um, Missouri, there's some restrictions um, that on being able to make retroactive payments. So we're not gonna be able to do that. So I'm not really sure what um, that may mean for us, but we certainly will investigate that. And invest in what the, the bill says and invest in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. And in my, uh, and I think um, now there's been clarification that sewer does mean storm sewer. So um, there's that opportunity for investment in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. And the act provides broad flexibility to um, cities to determine how to use that. And the um, local governments can use the funds to recover costs incurred by December 31st, 2024. Um, so staff, as I said, we've um, been uh, learning a lot about the, the, the act. We've been making sure we have the appropriate uh, accounting uh, procedures in place and that we're able to document, that we always do document, but anything specific for this rescue plan money, we have uh, working on that to make sure and again, just learning uh, about um, the different restrictions and eligibility, and we'll continue to do that. Obviously, one of the challenges we have is we have our budget coming up, and we also have some sales tax elections coming up. So um, even though those are separate and probably won't have an impact, there's still some things that we need to keep in mind as we go through the process. Um, Margie and Ryan, I don't know if there's any additional information that you all want to provide or if there are any questions, but. Just wanted to let you know that we did get our, our first allocation of money. Thank you, Mr. Kroll. Does council have any questions? Councilman Wiseman. I just have a quick question. So earlier you noted you were talking about um, sewer and you were talking about how you you real you uh, learned or that it was clarified to stormwater. Other than the guidance that you have been provided, there are gonna be some other vagaries. How are we finding out like these specific things? Is it just sort of like we've done in the past with like HUD, where we email and hope they email back? There's numerous um, different entities and organizations, including the Treasury Department, that provide and are conducting different training sessions. And okay. so we're, we're trying to attend as many of those as we can. Um, Margie just did one with the National League of Cities. Um, so I don't know if you guys have anything to add to that, but really it's just different professional organizations and trying to monitor those websites and get those. The Treasury does though, they sent out one document of guidance and they're working on another and then answering um, a lot of um, questions. They're really what they call it, their interim final review, uh, final interim final that that's what i was going to mention oh, okay. the, the treasury just put out an interim final rule so they're still taking comments and there's chances for things to change um and define things uh, more in more detail than than the generic kind of descriptions they have so it is still an interim rule there's still going to be changes to it thank you thank you any other questions okay thank you for that update um, item five, parking garage update. Mr. Marash. All right, got a little uh, presentation. I tried to email that out and, and um, also have some copies laid out for everyone. There's extra copies up here still. So, uh, but let's get right into it. and. I can talk a long time, so if you have a question, just wave me down and we'll try to answer it and move on. And I, I don't believe there was any intent to um, have a, any, any action tonight by the council, you know, part of them aren't here, but, um, you know, so there'll still be two weeks after this. To, if you have a question you think of, you know, get a hold of me, please. And like I said, I don't want uh, this opportunity to pass by because I didn't explain something well. So I want to try to, you know, briefly. And so really what this is, was get into it, but just kind of an overview of parking and then also focus on the garage bolts. So, um, so really the first, the first thing you talk about, you know, why do we even have a parking division or, or who uses our parking division? 
do you want to move the mic? I think it's out just so it's yeah. Is it coming Thank in there? You. Okay. Um, but basically, um, you know, so I got a lot of questions about, you know, who, who the who the users were or why are we building a garage for say just state employees or something like that. And so really I thought, well, we ought to clear this up. But if you look in our budget, it's pretty reflective of that mission. We we talk about with our employees a lot. You know, we're we're supposed to be uh, in the business of providing cost effective parking uh, for people in the downtown, whether it's a business owner, an employee of a business, you know, residents of the downtown. So we have people living down there now. But uh, you know, primarily, it, you know, this is not the goal is not to make the profit, you know, the most profit possible. So we don't run it to make the most profit possible, but it's it's basically a service group, just like any group of uh, uh, public works. I always tell all of our employees, we're in the service business, whether you're filling a pothole on a street or plowing snow or doing wastewater work or are, are working at the parking division, you're providing a service to the community. And so it's really not a profit center business, although the parking fund luckily uh, makes enough money to support itself. But, but really we're focused on that downtown user and having those uh, that street front full, but and, and we do that. And a good example of uh, why we don't make as you know, or why we're not making as much profit as we could is the Jefferson Street parking deck. Um, that is located on Jefferson Street between the Jefferson Building and High Street, so it's just north of High Street, about halfway down. There's a two-level parking lot or a garage. We call it a deck. And back in 2005, uh, when we did the study of trying to decide what the good mix of lease spaces were versus hourly and all that. We changed a few things around, but you know, if we wanted to make the most profit, we would just turn that into all lease spaces because it's our highest leased area. Of the, you know, the highest uh, uh, margin uh, on that on that space. So I think it's eighty dollars a month. That's our highest space uh, cost space. But we still had to reserve some for hourly, so people can, when they come down, if they're going to go shopping or go to a restaurant or whatever they're doing, they can still uh, find a place to park if they, if say. Madison and, and High are full there where it's free. You know, obviously that's free. That used to not be free before Streetscape uh, timeframe back in the 90s. Uh, when I first got out of college, uh, early 90s, I had a job down there in the Jefferson building and, you know, I had to walk to my parking garage that the state provided me as a state employee. I got to park there because I had a job there with the state. So I didn't have to use that or, or the streets, but those were meters there. You know, there was, so those are gone. So it's free parking, but that helps support Folks that just want to come into downtown, maybe eat lunch, do a little shopping, and then do their business at the bank, whatever they're doing. So just you know, to summarize there at the bottom, our primary customer focus is that is that business uh, community in downtown, and that's retail and restaurant offices. And you see all kinds, you know, there's legal, obviously two big banking institutions. There's lots of lobbyists uh, moving about uh, downtown. And then of course we have residential, and then then also the hourly. So we can't overlook the visitors that come in. And so during the legislative session, that's like Christmas time for downtown, okay, uh, in Jefferson City. So a lot of places, uh, if you're a retail business, you may survive. You say, well, I make all my money during Christmas season because I sell so much stuff, and then I survive the rest of the year, and I come back for Christmas. Well, in the parking business in Jefferson City, our big Christmas time is the legislative session and all the activities associated with it. So if you're coming in to visit your legislator, you might be lobbying a one-off thing, school groups, all kinds of things are happening. And I'll go through this in a minute, uh, but uh, but that is uh, who who uh, takes up those hourly spaces in the garage because, you know, maybe it's not that uh, they just need 90 minutes to go to a restaurant. They may be there to do something at the Capitol or spend the day, so they need to get in a garage and so they don't have to, you know, worry about moving their car, feeding the meter and all that good stuff. And, you know, it's cost effective too if to park in a garage on an hourly basis, so. Anyway, that's kind of is that. I hopefully that clears that up. But it's not state. The state provides its employees parking. Now I should go back and say, whoops, wrong way. Uh, now it doesn't mean that the state doesn't rent a block of spaces in some of our lots or garages. They may do that and provide those to their employee. But and we'd be open to that. But we can't. We can't. We don't take and fill up all the hourly spaces with leases either. So we got to reserve some of that. Pointer works here, but just uh, kind of going back through all the parking studies and how they how they came about. So uh, way before I worked here in 1999 was the first study, 
And so in the late 90s, they're thinking about this, obviously. It's right before the streets gate happened. And, uh, and basically, that was. Sure. Turn your mic on too. Thank you. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was asking what shape the Jefferson Street parking garage was in. Well, you know, we did do a few repairs to it, you know, like anything ongoing maintenance. I don't know particularly if we have a planned project, Britt would know more about that directly. But, you know, we've done some uh, water, uh, we had some water issues leaking down through the joints. So we tried to surface that and do some painting on it and things like that. But, you know, part of the issue, not only the, the main garage, but all these lots everywhere that we own, we're always maintaining them, whether it's filling potholes, uh, new surface, lighting, everything. So uh, if there's a particular need, Britt could probably point that out, though. I, I think Matt pretty much covered it. There's some routine maintenance items that need to be done. Uh, the upper deck, we did have problems with some water intrusion into the deck. Uh, and we, we worked on that a few years ago, and, and that, that treatment is toward the end of its life. Uh, so we have another project coming up on that. But we would consider them all generally routine type maintenance. How many stories is that? Two, yeah, the deck is two stories. That's why we call it a deck instead of a garage, because basically you can't circulate between floors. And so one is basically hourly meter type scenario, and the other one is reserved space. Just out of curiosity, is there a maximum height on that one? I know it's over by the Capitol, and I, you know. No. No, not necessarily a maximum height, you know, uh, so you may be getting that. Why, why is that not expanded? And we tried to cover that in our 2005 study we did internally, but uh, there, there's ne not necessarily a maximum height, but it's just the small footprint makes it almost impossible to add a lane where you can circulate in this thing. And really the cost per space would just go through the roof. It, it'll be lanes instead of parking. Thank you. Sure question uh so the fourth study so back in 99 people the councils were approving studies way back then and really i say 17 17 was just we had the same consultant we just did an update of the study in 17 but but basically it's a traffic study but it's a parking study so it's just done just like any traffic study we do and that's the methodology where you look at not only how many people are parked there but you look at the square footage of uh the uh, buildings around it and so you'll see some of these maps in a minute kind of showing a plus and minus but that's that's what they're doing they're looking at that square footage looking how much parking that would generate they do a model it's computer model and uh but it's very much like a traffic study we do for new developments and and then if you're say you're developing a, a, a business on missouri boulevard for example the new whatever slim chickens they have to do a parking calculation and so we see if they got enough parking on site to handle their square footage and their anticipated use. So that's really what this study did for all of down, the downtown area. And I'll show you the dimensions of that. Uh, but, it, but it's pretty good stuff, but it's very routine. The methodology is sound. And so it's, it's the tried and true method to do this stuff. And then you calibrate your model to make sure you're not off by, by actual observations. And we're talking about peak demand too, by the way. Uh, so then 2005, that was an internal staff study that we did, and Britt and I were the primary people who put that together. Uh, but basically, we reviewed the rates and parking distribution. The other thing that happened in 2005, why our bosses told us to do it at the time, uh, we paid off the bonds on the current parking garage finally. And uh, so they said, okay, you know, we have this study from 99 that shows the need. We just paid our bonds off. So what are the rates? How can we afford a new garage? So then that's why we were really looking at that. And we haven't changed the rates since, by the way. That was the last time. So it was, it was a big effort. We had lots of meetings with the downtown association, business owners, all kinds of people, and, and people who own property to see if they were willing to sell it for a parking garage. And we, at that time, we did, hadn't found any property that people were willing to sell. Uh, so, so many years later, so our rates, our revenue exceeds our expenses in parking. And so, but we told folks at that time, you know, we were raising the rates a little bit. However, we're banking this money. Hopefully in the future, we'll, we'll maintain the lots better and hopefully in the future build a parking garage at some point when we can find the appropriate place. So, you know, 14 years go by. And so we go, okay, it's time to, you know, we need to get on with this. Uh, it's probably, you know, I'll blame it on Brett. We waited so long, but 
but basically uh, I'm blaming for everything. So, uh, and so we said, okay, let's, let's do an analysis of available property. You know, we we're, we're accumulating quite a bit of money in the parking fund. You know, we know this is working and uh, even not changing the rates since 05, but so we analyzed five different sites and I got a little map of that in a minute, but uh, basically looked at those. And then in 2019, that same year, you know, it, it, it was a fairly quick study. It's pretty easy to do. You just look at the shape of the garages and location and things like that and see what your, what, uh, what available parking you could get out of a site. And uh, it's pretty straightforward, but we began speaking with property owners. So really we've been negotiating since 2019 with two property owners and it just takes a lot of time. And, uh, and so in 2021, this year, that's when we popped up with the contract. So probably the, the, Part of that I missed for the council was a lot of new councilmen uh, since then, and uh, you know not having you know seemed like I've been living this my whole life, but uh, not everybody in this room has. So uh, trying to get everybody up to speed now, so we we can make a good decision. But that's kind of the history. Buddy, is anything? But just on the studies, and so like I said, we we mimic the '99 study in this uh, 17 update. But the boundary is pretty large, so it encompasses state government. That's one of our big drivers, obviously. So it goes from the river down the expressway over on the east end over to uh, Jackson Street and then back over to Bolivar Street or Wares Creek. And if you look at that inventory, there's almost 9,600 spaces. And uh, so I got it broken down here. So the public controls, you know, the, the th a couple thousand listed there, 2,700 or so, 2,800. Uh, and that's a combination of on street parking and off street public lots. And then the private and the state, we lump state in there because if it's a state lot, you can't use it unless you have the hang tag to get there that you get given by, by your office uh, or a private lot. There's, so there's a lot of little private lots scattered about, but they fulfill a parking need. So the thing about the state and the private lot, so during the peak time of the day, you can't stack parking in them like we can as a public entity. I call it stacking parking, but a shared use parking, I think is the appropriate term out of these studies. But, but if you were to, uh, say go to, I know, I know the mayor, for example, uh, and I pick on you, you have a couple spaces behind your building and, uh, that's, that's for her business, but we don't let people just visiting a restaurant, go park in her space. That's her private property. And, uh, and so there's some others with bigger lots. Hawthorne bank has a big lot behind it and that's for their customers. And they kind of patrol that, uh, central bank obviously has a lot of lots, things like that. Uh, but in the street, we can, we can move the parking through the street and that's why we encourage the 90 minute parking downtown is so you can go do a little business, move on and then somebody else can come. So we use, utilize that space multiple times in one day to stack that parking in there and gain the, gain the most we can. Now, somebody picked up on the overall parking uh, uh, throughout the occupancy throughout the entire study boundary, that big area is, is only 52%. So there must be plenty of parking. Well, you know, that includes, you know, the lot outside City Hall here that sets vacant all the time, um, you know, and then other lots, you know, on the periphery. So the consultant picked up on that page 12. You know, they mentioned that, that you know, one, one problem with that number, if you're just to look at that, yeah, it does look pretty good. But it's all these peripheral lots that really don't serve uh, where our draws are, which is basically the, the capital activities go along with it in downtown. So... Just trying to explain that. I think there was a question about that earlier. Mr. Marash, and I know you kind of used the <clears> example <throat> of pointing out how some of us do have, and even others, I think, around the room that have uh, parking in the downtown area. Uh, but I think one uh, one distinction, too, I don't remember if you mentioned it, but the people who lease a spot, let's say even in a garage or, or a city-owned spot, they may lease that for long-term parking, and they may not be there right now, but nobody else can park in that spot. So it's the same thing. Well, a little bit, and, and that's a good point. But so yeah, there's people in this room I know that have leased parking uh, in the city garage or maybe a lot somewhere. And uh, so what happens is in most of our lots, uh, like let's just talk about our garage, our main garage. So there's a mix of lease spaces and hourly spaces. So we wanna keep some openings for that hourly. Uh, and so, yes, it's true that uh, that we don't, oh, those folks always don't always show up on the same day, whether it's just life happens or they're from out of town and they just need the space when they get there. So on our main garage, we do an oversell by a certain percentage of those because we know those, we can accommodate them by shuffling. So it's kind of a more an art than a science that our parking staff will look at the hourly and who's showing up, big activity at the legislator or something like that. And so we got to make sure we, we have a lease. You've got to have a space. And so we kind of balance that. 
but we, we do do an oversell rate, so it's not widely known, but that's how that happens. But we, we're able to do that because we can always back off on our hourly parking. Thank you. Because sometimes I know the comment has been brought up that they see spots available, so sometimes they may appear available. They not aren't always available. Right, so and, and now that's just the garage. Each one's different, of course. You know, this makes it more complicated. So the Jefferson Street deck, that's a good uh, question for that. So you'll go down and you go down in there and you see a lot of open spaces. Well, a lot of people from out of town like to lease those spaces year round, but it's such a small facility, you can't really oversell it. And you, it's hard to use it for hourly and sign it because that person could show up any day and need, need their space. And so in a bigger facility like a garage, we can do that a lot easier and manage that a lot better. So a little little extra here about the inventory, but so basically, you know, obviously it was recognized there's governmental. So they split this whole study into two zones uh, and they overlap by, by the capital, basically. I'll show you on the map here in the next slide or two. But uh, the first zone we call the governmental zone, and that's west of Jefferson Street. And they call out a parking deficit of almost 2,000 spaces. And I believe OA has been uh, looking at this study and using these numbers in the past as well, you know. And that, that's really talking about uh, you know, the state office building, the square footage versus how much they use. And, you know, COVID threw a lot of this off, but I think the governor pretty much with the snap of his fingers made it all come back the next one day. Uh, zone two is east of Broadway, so a couple blocks over coming back this way. And this is really the focus of this parking garage in the, in the downtown study. And in that area, the, the deficit is currently 592, they're showing. And in future, if you build out all the vacant space, so in other words, there's upper story apartments, things like that, uh, and other vacant lots, you could get up to the need of about a little over 700 spaces is the estimate. But you, get, you still gotta realize, you know, so I think the question was, well, I see folks, you know, there's not a parade of cars driving around looking for spaces. Well, that's true. Uh, but in March, April, May, that's that's really our, when the peak legislative activity happens. So that's the time we're talking about, plus open square footage. Uh, and that's where you get those numbers. So it's just very much like a traffic study. You try to try to look at what, how can we accommodate those times? Now, you know, I think this is the point the mayor just made is the lobbyists and other are willing to lease the space the full year. Well, this is actually a good problem to have because when they're not there, we can have additional hourly spaces. And then uh, of course, um, off peak, we still have the space available for festivals and the like that go on downtown. We know that happens all the time. But I just want to point out, you know, I think we threw out a number of 1,600. Well, that was the overall deficit of zone one and two combined in the future. So now you can't just add those numbers together because you got that two, two block overlap. So it's kind of goofy math. It kind of looks a little goofy, but I, can, I think I can explain it better with a picture here after this slide. But just give you a couple more examples of zone two here. Uh, so in zone two downtown, public parking to support urban development, we have no on-street park, or we have no on-site parking requirements in the zoning code, uh, unless you were drastically change your use or knock down a bunch of buildings, and it would kick in. But generally, if you go downtown, try to redevelop a property, uh, you're not going to have to provide additional parking like you would if you were at the mall or Missouri Boulevard or wherever you are. You got to provide your parking, and that's because our zoning code's assuming that our um, that our, the public is su supplying those spaces through this parking utility. And right now, we own we control about 40% of the parking downtown. Desirable, uh, this is kind of a rule of thumb from our consultant, you wanna get, you wanna get about 50%, and then you can really support the activities and redevelopment and things like that in your downtown zone. So with this proposal, uh, you know, so we're taking, we're adding, uh, I think it's, uh, what is it here? It says 383 in our little chart here in our book, but it's really a net gain of about 310 um, spaces. So with that, if we were to do this project, we would get up in the, about 44% of the garage, uh, or excuse me, of the parking would be publicly controlled. So we're getting closer to the 50, that's the goal. Um, you know, there's that probably other options to increase parking downtown, and obviously one's the parking garage, that's the one we're focused on right now, but other, other ideas have been brought up. You could contract with private lots that are underutilized. You know, they're reserving it just for their business. CenturyLink lot comes up just right off the, off the main high street uh, corridor. 
and you know they're reserving those for there. We've Brits had conversation with them in the past if they'd be willing to lease that, and we could treat it like a public lot. And they, at that time, we're not willing. So that you find that a lot if you have parking for your own staff, probably unwilling to give it up in many cases. <clears throat> Matt, how long was that uh, discussion? How long did that take place yeah. ago? Been a little while, yeah. And you know, like CenturyLink, for example, used to have people. You know, I think it was called, was it called Sprint at the time when they had the lot, they had all the parkers right out here. So you'd see a parade of workers coming down at, at five to, you know, get in their cars here. And that's, it's changed. But, uh, but yeah, that's still something we'd be interested in if they're a good lot that we can manage and sell. Uh, but, you know, sometimes you get in a situation if our lots are too far away, even, you know, we may own them, but we can't fill them up. So, it, you know, just depends on where it is and things like that. It's still, still a good option, though. Uh, shuttle service, so we've had two examples of that that I know of, I'm aware of, uh, but basically, you know, that's if you have a building like this full of workers or something like that, or in this case, DNR, they built their new building, and so they got in a deal with the city where we ran a shuttle bus. At the time, it was just paying for the drivers and the gas, and it was about 150000 some dollars a year. I think it stopped in 2008, but basically they were shuttling people in, the, in, a, in a system up to their new building. Uh, YPRO more, more recently uh, had all their workers parked out here in City Hall lot because it was available and they had their own private little bus that would take them across the highway to a building uh, where Newman Conley Ruth is, resides. And now they've since moved and, you know, obviously people didn't like that arrangement very well, but they were kind of a captured audience when you're the, an office worker and boss says, well, this is where you park, you get on the bus, you come over. They've since, if you've been out by the mall, they've moved out there where they have plenty of, of parking for them. So that 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 works, but not not the best desired, and it's really not the goal of satisfying visitors and things like that and businesses trying to trying to come into downtown. So back to the where are these zones, and, and we cut off the left, just trying to make it fit on. But the capital is right. Oops, sorry, the capital is right here. This big red square. The proposed uh, property we'd like to see is in this green. And if you look at those numbers, I think it says plus 21 on the green. Of course, it says the red red is minus. So that's the Truman Building to the left. Um, get this thing to work here. So that's that's the Truman Building area. And then you get the uh, Broadway and the Supreme Court area here. So what what this is telling you is a couple things. Uh, so in that block where, say, the state capital is, there's not very much parking compared to the square foot of property built out in that block. Doesn't mean that. So then you look at the blue and it's got extra. Well, obviously, these are state parking lots that feed these red dots, right? And so, and then in the green, you know, it's got a little extra parking for compared to the square footage just in that block. But, you know, this is Central Bank. We're trying to get, uh, trying to acquire the Central Bank lot. So, you know, these people are parking here and then walking downtown predominantly uh, over to their building. So there's not a lot of square footage there because it's got some parking lots in it already. And so, what, you know, that's ideally what we're looking for. Uh, the city, I'm sure I got my bearings here. City controls these lots down here, or this, excuse me, this lot, this one down here with the green on it. And, uh, and so basically, you know, we have excess space in those lots, but the hill becomes quite a challenge and people don't want to walk there. It's obvious it's uh, ugh, not as close to downtown either. So I would dare say we have very few people. There might be some, but very few actually park there and want to uh, work or whatever downtown. Uh, Central Bank does have the lot above it and some other parking, and you do see some people walking the hill. So zone two, again, where we're primarily focused, this is why, you know, you can't just add those numbers directly, but again, the capital's still on there. The parking garage proposal is here in the green lot. And so, you know, this green lot is ideally situated next to all this red, where there's more built square footage in that block. So the buildings are already there versus where the parking is. So what's kind of interesting about this, if you look up here where the blue is, this, this is where our parking garage is. So. Obviously, we got 500 and some spaces up there. So we have an excess in that little block because of, there's not very many buildings built in that block. So that's how you read this table. So it's maybe not intuitive to some, but but those people then are walking to the red parts. You know, obviously you come out of the garage, you walk down here and you go to your office space or wherever you're going. That's that's why it looks like that. But that does tell us when you look at this map, 
don't want to get too engineering on anybody, but you know, that that's why this is an ideally situated place uh, for a parking garage. It's surrounded by red straddles of the zones. And, uh, and, and so we'll have a customer base ready to go for this. So again, feasibility study 2019, five sites were looked at. I'll have a map of that in a second, but the central bank warehouse was the preferred option we brought forward to council with, because we were able to get some properties uh, contracts in place. But, you know, again, looking at that study and I'll go through this a little more detail, but they're looking at constructability. How many levels do you have? You know, you, you got to have six stories or just four, you know, that kind of thing, because people don't generally like to wind up to the top of a parking garage and back down every day. Uh, so you look at net gain, meaning, you know, is there already a parking lot there? So you're taking those out and you're putting some back and, you know, you're paying for those. And that that factors into the efficiency ratio, relative costs, et cetera. And then stuff I added kind of to it. Uh, this study didn't go into this as much, but you know, they're in the red, uh, the location barrier. So historic buildings in your high street frontage. So, you know, everybody understands about tearing down historic buildings to build parking is probably not a very popular idea in most towns, including this one, or taking up your main business district uh, street frontage with just parking like they did with our current garage. So I'm sure that was an interesting topic. If we go back and look at newspapers, there's probably some discussion about it, which I haven't done, but maybe, maybe there is. Uh, back in the 60s when that was built. But, you know, that's the that's the property generating revenue. Now, some people have tried to uh, compensate for that by building, you know, uh, lease space into a parking garage in their low level, street level. And, you know, that's successful in some some low locales. Uh, others, not so much. You know, it just depends. It's pretty high dollar space to have to rent where you, when you should have, you know, when it was built to park a car on. So, it, you know, mixing those two together isn't always the best. And then in this town, topography is always a big issue walking up the hill. Some people can't physically do it. They may not actually be handicapped, but just walking up the hill can kind of get your heart rate going. And I know from walking up to the county all the time, uh, it's probably good for me though. But then another one that I like to talk about is willing sellers. So that's a good term we started using a while back because I don't think most local governments, including ours, don't like to condemn property. So we want to work with people who want to, you know, can sell the property for a price or whatever the price is. That doesn't mean the city council couldn't condemn property. They didn't like the price. Uh, but, you know, we look for those willing sellers and try to come to some agreement that's reasonable that the council can support and explain to the public without going through that condemnation process. But, you know, another thing to bring up, you know, I don't think, you know, back in 05, and I doubt this council or any other, many others, Back then, I think it was Exchange Bank, but you know they weren't really willing to sell their parking lot, and that was one of our main goals. Is maybe looking there, one of our main sites, and uh, and so they weren't really weren't willing. So obviously, we're not going to condemn one of the uh, large financial institutions in town. It just probably doesn't look good, you know, for a local community of this size. Uh, five sites. So rattling right through this pretty quick. Stop me if you have a question. Uh, so the green side, again, this is the same map, just overlaid with the sites on it, but, you know, this is the one we're proposing here with the plus 21 state capital up there. Uh, but basically, we, you know, trying to dodge all these historic properties and things. And, uh, you know, we looked at uh, right along McCarty, McCarty Street's right down here. So we looked at all these five sites. If you look at the three to the left, they're all pretty square. The site we're talking about is the biggest square. But having those square like that is a big deal. Um, you know, you can make the circulation work much better. You can park off both sides of the aisle when you drive up in it. So that makes it more efficient, things like that. And so, uh, you know, and, and just looking at those now, it doesn't mean, and there's a chart in here, page uh, page eight has a chart of all of these sites and kind of compares some of the, the detail, but I, get a, I got a few questions about this uh, JC Penney building lot. Well, it's right here. And that's the uh, CenturyLink light. You can see how small it is compared to some of these others as well, but it's an oddball shape. So it's very inefficient. I think that our study says uh, in six levels, you could get um, net gain of 300, da, 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 no, I'm wrong building, 174 spaces. So pretty high cost per space uh, to build there. This one, it looks like a stealth bomber over here on the yellow lot, uh, just right across the street, basically up the hill, halfway up the hill runs into the jail, the jail buildings were right there. Uh, you know, so we own some of that property already, uh, or much of that property, but again, that oddball shape, trying to circulate people around it efficiently, not, not a very good uh, option. So 
back to the top rated site, you know, so what are the attributes? Why would we even talk about this site? Central bank, I call it the central bank warehouse site, two properties. It's four levels, multiple levels uh, entry. So you enter off McCarty and, and enter and exit off Wallway, the alley. So basically the Wallway would be the fourth, the higher floor, uh, the fourth floor. And, uh, and so, you know, if you circle to the top, you'd always come right out the top too. So that plus the top, if you were in it, if you parked on the bottom elevator right up, very flat walk right out to High Street. So that kind of conquers that whole uh, issue of, of grade that people don't like to deal with, some people can't deal with. And in our contract, uh, I'll mention, uh, if you were to look at our contract that's on the council agenda, there is some discussion that we, both entities would agree to keep talking about what that pedestrian ac access looks like on some other central bank property. Uh, square shape and size again, both sides of aisles. So example of an inefficient garage is the old St. Mary's garage. So it's now the hotel garage up here. But if you were to drive in, you'll notice, you may not have noticed, but if you're building a parking garage, you notice, uh, you can only park off that. So the two-way traffic, you can only park on one side of the two-way traffic. So that makes those, you gotta pay for that regardless. It's just more efficient to park off both sides of it. So it costs less per space to build because uh, you're going to build the aisle regardless. So that's an example. But, you know, at the time, that's all the space they had and they needed a garage. And I'm sure, you know, that was the decision that was made. Uh, institutional money again. So they could have probably afford to do that. They weren't necessarily trying to make a profit off their part. Again, proximity to demand. So state capital, obviously, if I think everybody would realize state, the state capital and its activities drives the downtown. We have a lot of restaurants, uh, shopping, all kinds of things down there because of all the activity at the state capitol. That's really what drives that. And, uh, and and the high street zone, you know, so it's between the zones. Flat walk, I already talked about that. We're not taking out any of that high value street frontage or altering historic uh, streetscapes or something like that. And we have uh, willing sellers. You could uh, acquire the property with no, no condemnation required. That's assuming we can live with the prices. Yeah, uh, that is a <coughs> that is um, proposal on a is in a historic district though, right? Uh, I assume it's in a historic district, yeah, because in that downtown area, uh, the building, the you know the warehouse building's old. I don't know if it's historic, but uh, probably a lot of people didn't know what was going on back there anyway. Uh, so yeah, most things in this town are old, but it's not like taking down two hundred High Street. Right, Ryan. So when we did that, you know, very expensive to even tear it down. Well, uh, someone was giving me a, a historical lesson as far as like Schmidt Apartments there that yeah. has some historical significance in our community. And my concern is that could be damaged with with the removal of the warehouse and, and the construction of new. Oh, the bridge. apartments next door. You mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The I think if we can take down two hundred high, we can easily take this building down. I'm very comfortable with that without damaging adjacent properties. Question? A uh, little more about this site, uh, you know, in having public parking in two different locations that are, you know, a little bit farther apart than some of the other sites, that's a good thing, disperse that traffic flow when it's time to either get there or leave. You know, this is this is right on McCarty Street and Arterio Street, so that's really good. Jefferson as well, you, you can get out of there. The other one's obviously on Capitol and Madison to get in and out of. Um, added parking, we get 300, about 300 available extra spaces, you know, from what's already there. So it's a little more than that actual size, but you get plus 300. And, you know, the, the best thing about having that parking uh, issue where we're only using it at certain times of the year, then you get all this other available parking for community events off hours or weekends or whatever. So, you know, anybody could park in it. We open the garages up for these things. I think in 4th of July, though, you know, a lot of times we can't, I think in the past we've had, but more recently uh, you can't get down to the uh, main garage you know it's just blocked in by all the activities so you know this one i would assume would not be in that that it had that issue but again going to a parade downtown all the high school parades and various things uh people are parked everywhere this would help with that so you can have these community events i think uh, uh councilman wiseman brought up about you know public facilities that's a lot of talk about that you know, planning those into this thing so we get an opportunity with a fresh slate to do some of that stuff. Um, and then just, you know, do we have customers for this thing? You know, that's the fear we said, you know, we had a need shown from this study, but 
uh, you know, are we worried about that? I, you know, I'm not worried about it at all because really 50% of it could probably be leased right off the bat before it's built because we have a waiting list on Jefferson Deck. So this is essentially the same location, <coughs> probably a little better to get to. Uh, it's going to have more facilities in it. Uh, so there's a, there's a good waiting list there just to get in that thing. And then, uh, yeah. What does the occupancy rate have to be to cover costs? Well, I got a little slide here we can go over, yeah, about that. Um, and, it, and it can be different too. Uh, but uh, then Central Bank um, has a contract provision, if you look at our sales contract, that they would like additional space than they already have. And uh, besides the ones they're replacing, they're willing to pay the market rate, that's what the contract says, but they want an option to buy more. And so just those two entities right there, uh, are those two lists, if you will, uh, would sell half of the half of the lease space right there or half of the space could be leases in that regard and above what we have now central bank does want to go uh shift theirs to the other garage because it's close to their facility but you know i'm sure other people want to shift back over because we ran out of space on jefferson street in our little deck you know parking deck and so there'll be people wanting to shift over there i'm sure to be closer to the capital so it'll just be a mix um and then something to just kind of point out we got talking about this um so you see a few developments going on in downtown, you know, and uh, I didn't list them all here, but three, three or four right now with a new hotel, obviously over there on Bolivar Street, but just off downtown, it's a great location. You have big, the big whiskey restaurant and that building and other things going on in there. Uh, new coffee shops getting ready to go in on the other side of the street with some living above it. Uh, Veterans United just down the street, just on McCarty Street, uh, putting an office building in. So you have a lot of activity on the periphery all of those folks have parking in their facilities. Now, some of them might wish they had a little more, uh, but again, uh, you know, drawing some of that downtown, if there are parking available, I'm sure Central Bank has a plan. They know they need parking uphill. Uh, they have they have open parking lots downhill, uh, but they're, they're looking at their offices downtown. So this is kind of an economic driver too, with some of these businesses, what they can do in downtown with parking. uh so some planning level cost uh so the property the, on the council agenda right now is nine hundred thirty-eight thousand. the new garage if you went through the report uh I, I broke it out and just added it all up but it has all the financing you know this is an estimate planning level estimate but it's it's a little over 12 million and that's if you're assuming bonding and all this stuff uh so a new garage with the property and everything i did the math you know a little over 13 million uh, rehab, existing garage, you know, we know we need to do things there. Uh, we, so we stuck in a placeholder of a million dollars there. You know, we just worked on our working on the elevator now. I think we spent 40 grand on that. I know we have a stairwell that needs done. We have some falling concrete. You know, I don't, I don't, the garage isn't unsafe, but it needs some work, you know. I just got a question on, on sure. that garage. It just seems like there's a lot, I, I walked it today, that there's a lot of maintenance issues that's just been neglected. Yeah. Painted handrails. I mean, there's a lot of rusty handrails. There's a lot of rust on the structural beams, um, cracks in the, in the stairwells on the concrete. I mean, is, do we not have a maintenance program to, uh, well we do, but some of these things, for example, handrails, the steel, if you, once you get enough rust in it, we can paint it over and over and then you just can't control it. You really need to remove it, put a new handrail in. Same for some of the beams. They all need sand, sandblasted all the way down. Uh, put back. Uh, you know, the thought is that it's very intrusive to do some of this work and try to keep the parking going. So again, kind of going back to our service component, uh, I think Dr. Pope said it better than I did because I wasn't here in the 80s when they did it, but he was, he said, and said it caused havoc in his downtown, you know, kicking everybody out to do this work. So we're, we were hopeful we'd get this new garage, could temporarily shift some people, have some space available, and then sh oops, shut pieces of it down uh, so that we could do that work. So that was one of the other things about having a new garage uh, where we could shift some people into convenient spaces. And, and going back on to your parking facility feasibility analysis from 2019, you know, site A and site B were kind of neck and neck. Yes, sir. Um, is, or, is there a reason why we didn't pursue? We did pursue site B uh, for years, uh, we did. And I've had meetings in the bank uh, with multiple city administrators and mayors <laughs> and over the years. And, uh, 
you know, we were kind of said, well, we'll talk about it. We'll talk to the, board. you know, I don't, you know, we're not getting their business, but you know, they ended up, they, they, at the time, last time I spoke with them, they were, you know, just not interested. They needed to maintain their own. Thank you. But yeah, you're exactly right. The, uh, so then from the finance side of things, the fund balance of the parking division is 5.1 million right now. Give her, you know, I know Margie, uh, you know, that's the audited number. I think I rounded it off, but, uh, so oh, since, uh, we paid off the bonds, I, I want to say it was like a $2 million payment in 2005 almost. So we had built up a little extra money and we paid the bonds off early. And, uh, since then, you know, like I said, we adjust our rates then, but you know, we were bringing in excess money at the time. So we didn't ever, you know, probably should have kept incrementally going up, but we didn't, we were bringing in more than we needed. And we were, you know, uh, I won't say we're, well, we were frugal with the money. We don't, you know, we don't waste it, uh, but, you know, knowing that we need to do some of this stuff, but, but now we have this money sitting there and that money, I just want to point out is brought in with our monthly leases. That's, that's a major component. Then you have the hourly, whether that's on street meters or hourly in a garage or a lot. And then of course the fine structure that if you violate the rules, you know, uh, those are the tickets we collect. So, so through those three things that you start accumulating this money, uh, and I got a little bit more about it here, but okay. Uh, so anyway, fund balance 5.1 and talk about the three sources from our rates in 05. So in 18 and 19, these are the audited numbers. If you look at your budget book back, we go back, uh, I guess three years, uh, to look at that, but you can go back further, but 18, we exceeded our, uh, our revenue over expense by 327 revenue over expense 420. In 19 and COVID hits in 20, we still exceeded our expense by a hundred thousand almost, but you know, so we, we just managed through that. Hopefully we're back on the right track and people are back in town, uh, enjoying themselves doing things in Jeff city. So, uh, I'd, I'd say next year, you know, where this is kind of towards, you know, the legislative season's over. So our peak season fastest by again. So we'll probably have another slightly down year, I'm assuming, but it's starting to come back pretty nicely. Um, but next year I'd expect to be back up in those same ranges, uh, costs. So if you look at the study page 45, 47, they kind of went through all these costs of this garage and said, okay, you know, based on, uh, the split, Aaron, uh, you had the question, uh, they, they put one in there and I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what it was, but they assumed a certain split in the garage of lease and, and hourly and said, okay, you need input from the system for 275,000 to keep this uh to to afford this garage as they have outlined for us and so basically oops, let's hit the wrong button um so you know when i look at I, you know the main numbers i'm looking at you know okay we know all parking garages uh our consultants said well i've been doing this for 35 years and he inherited a company his dad had started doing parking garages before that none of them pay for themselves it's a parking system that pays for a garage so i look at those two numbers and even at our current rates the 275 and some pretty conservative assumptions by the consultant. Uh, you know, it's well within the, the available uh, uh, revenue over expense right there. And this is similar how we did the last garage, um, last bond payment 05. So I don't, I didn't answer your question directly, but, but that could be adjusted. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's always risk. This is a pretty not risky proposal really is what, you know, and cause engineer types like myself and even the consultant are, you know, we're probably a little risk adverse more, you know, compared to business people, uh, you know, we're always very conservative. And so, you know, again, we haven't modified the rates. Uh, we could always generate more money by more leasing. If we got in trouble, uh, with finances for some reason, I don't, I don't think we're there, but that that's, I assume where the question was headed. Th that one was yes. Um, but so when we calculated the amount that it would cost, for purchase of the property, um, for uh, building the new garage, and for um, repairing our old garage, um, what what is going to be our suggested cost for tearing down? If we were to purchase that additional property, what would be the cost for for tearing down that property? Does it have asbestos or anything else that we need to be concerned about? A high dollar demolition. Um. I, you know, I don't see it as high dollar demolition. I think we had a planning level number, hundred thousand. You know, we're and we're basing that on. You know, obviously we tore a pretty expensive building down downtown. Uh, a little more than that to tear that building down, but 
had all those issues you're talking about, plus very close to another business. We had to bring in a specialty contractor, all that stuff. But really, any more asbestos is just part of the deal. We have a standard contract at the city. When we tear any of these houses down, we go through it, and it becomes a special waste, goes in landfill. It's really not a deal breaker on that side. You know, we just have a planning number of 100000 on that. Mr. Kroll? I also wanted to add that financing costs are very favorable now, not as quite as favorable as they were eight months ago, but they're still very favorable. We did this study. We put, I think the consultant had 2.75, three, three and a half, three, seven, whatever it is right here, I can look it up, but it was pretty much higher than we would expect now to get. But that's assuming we move on with this. Uh, if not, you know, then you know, who knows where the rates go eventually. But um, did I answer your question? Any others? Uh, basically, I'm getting to the end here. So if you think of anything, getting hoarse a little bit, uh, talking fast, but new garage. So, you know, really the next step, we're, we're at the decision point. We're purchased, you know, pursuing the new garage. We purchased the property. It's already on the council agenda to be done next meeting. Or, you know, if we're not going to purchase that property, okay, that's the status quo, what we have now. And that's an option, I suppose. But uh, so these are the steps. If we were to purchase the property as I see them, we'd finalize our deal at the council meeting, um, pursue design contracts for the new garage, develop a renovation plan for existing. So we'd want to do that all kind of at the same time, probably using the same uh, consultant more than likely. Uh, review our, and then go back and do what we did in 05, review all the allocations again, see where we're at, what our history is telling us, you know, how many times are we selling out the garage and how many lease spaces do we have? Do we have waiting lists? Do we have people approaching us? All those things. Also factoring in central bank's request in the contract, uh, things like that. Uh, but go back and look at all those allocations and rates and make sure we're on up where we need to be. And, and we'll have to do this if we're going to do this uh, for a bonding plan. So the, they'll want to know what our what our ability to pay is and all that good stuff. And so then that'd be the bonding plan for the new garage. And then you could, you know, this is pretty straightforward stuff, tearing down a building and, demo, and you know, garages are pretty straightforward. It's a structural process, but, you know, it's like a tinker toy set. They just kind of build on each other. Uh, but, you know, you could really be turning dirt in 22, so. Councilman Spicer. How long ago was this property value? I know that's pretty uh, well, the, the uh, uh, appraisals were done in 20, uh, 2019. But, you know, right now that just kind of the end here, you know, this is street view now, you know, it's a kind of an open area, you know, and you talk to our planners, long-term plans, they like see more housing and things along this area on McCarty Street. Um, but, you know, something of scale of this, you know, especially the top one, I could really see something like that along McCarty Street, you know, it fits in, got a little brick on it. It's not over the top, but you can get pretty fancy. The costs just go up. That's a facade issue. The main structure is all pretty much the same, but, uh, but yeah, that, that would be a nice addition to the streetscape. Councilman Ward. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and I apologize if you covered this and I just missed it. Um, are you aware of any developers or individuals who have been interested in property on High Street or in the surrounding area to restore or renovate who decided not to do that due to our parking issues? Um, you know, I think it's always a consideration, and I, I had it in here, I didn't say it out loud, but it's in one of the slides, like the Wymore Apartments, for example, is a good example. Now, they went ahead and did it, uh, and I think uh, the fellow from Columbia that did it, Jay Birchfield, sent us a letter. But as one of his biggest considerations when he's going to put money in his thing is where, where are these people going to park? I'm going to have a nice place for them now, renovate this thing and make it look good. Uh, and so the council at the time got together and we said, okay, uh, passed a code where uh, those people uh, can buy us by basically a reserved space on street in a certain zone of parking meters near the building and park on the street there. So it does take up a parking metered space, but they're, that's how they're allowed to do that. Now that's that's just the example that went forward. I'm sure there's others out there, but I'm pretty sure it's a pretty high consideration for most folks. 
Well, and I wonder too, I'm not sure if your question also could be looked at as some of the businesses that have been lost. I mean, I know the salon downtown, Haute Salon, for example, cited parking as a reason because there's the short-term parking, but for their clients needing the long-term parking. So they moved out and it was in the newspaper too, out in the media, they cited that. Um, also, I mean, the JC Penney building, we've had a few developers that have talked with the city and working on that and they've cited parking needs um, as an issue for just renovation because they're, it's a large building, so they will need substantial parking that doesn't exist. I mean, just kind of adding to that. Yeah, and just, and, and I don't like to tell everybody's business, I was in a public meeting, but developers talk to us all the time about all kinds of sites, but you know, one of the more recent ones uh, did indicate, you know, in downtown, he's involved in downtown uh, development, he said, you know, he's really uh, focused on residential in, in a high respect, but, you know, primary primary consideration, where are they going to park, uh, how much is this going to cost, um, you know, all the typical things, and, you know, then, but but keeping the street level commercial, of course, but uh, there's a lot of value in some uh, nice apartments downtown, and they're well leased by people. And another oh, one, yeah. well. Yeah, the CVB just sent us a letter. We talked to Diane. A little bit because we were recalling her her uh you know that her office is right on the corner where this is you know very close to this uh, site one of her primary things was uh just people coming you know and then these are just visitors of course but uh probably ran you know one-off visitors maybe but uh you know her site she wants one of her drivers for moving to where she is now she has more parking available so. And also even the governor office building, even though that's been several years ago, that was contingent upon the city providing parking in the Madison garage. Right, the redevelopment, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is always a hot topic if something like this comes up. And so the, actually the city had to give them a special consideration to get that development there, uh, the building redone uh, at the governor's uh, spot there in our garage. Because the other option there was to actually make it into a parking lot, like that was the other, there were, proposals at the time. So the one that actually was awarded was to renovate, but they had to get parking. Yeah, when I, do it. when I first started, got out of college and was working in the Jefferson building, I walked past it all the time and the windows were all out of it and pigeons going in and out. And our parking garage was just on the other side of the governor's uh, mansion there. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was pretty dilapidated. What's that? Councilman Fitzwater. I had a couple of general questions and a couple on the pro forma. The comment you made about the beauty salon not finding parking, was it they couldn't find free parking or they couldn't find parking? Um, Long-term parking for their clients that needed longer than 90 minutes. I believe behind that block was, was it two hour metered? I think two was max and they sometimes did uh, services that required more than two hours and so they needed more of the long term which they could have gone in the madison garage of course yeah that but was my question i think That's some of their clients sure. would park behind and end up being kind of right at that limit and uh, so their customers were getting ticketed for that but certainly the dynamic of that uh, they did cite it as as uh, a need because they didn't have enough parking even i mean employee parking and client parking that was more uh, easier they found areas that were easier i think for their clients to find long-term parking no the one that cited parking is the reason they left was the one uh, on the 100 block south at the time do we have any businesses downtown that provide parking vouchers during the times when we do charge for parking. Uh, yeah, I believe Madison's. Uh, yeah. Up to a certain amount, or for the value of the parking. Yeah. Madison's validates for one hour, uh, and then uh, some law firms validate as much as a person wants in the garage. Some will validate for two hours. It's it's a customer decision on the, on their part. It was my question related to the comment. I guess I'd never seen it in writing, and I know it's a fine distinction. And I do realize we're a city, but the parking division being a service organization, 
you know, we're attracting businesses downtown that are charging market rates for their services or products. And I, I agree with you. I don't want to gouge people, but I do want to make sure that we're charging market rates. Also, it seems like our meters are fairly inexpensive. They you are. You can park, you, assuming you could park all day for a quarter per hour, that's $2 for the day. We charge $6 in the garage to park for the day. So it seems like as a part of this entire process, we probably need a reevaluation of our entire parking structure. Yeah, that's number four on the list there, that allocation of rates, looking back at that, similar to 05. And then on the performer, does this propose that the garage would be 100%, do the numbers propose 100% parking in the garage? Uh, all the lease spaces, all the no, I, I don't hourly lease so. spaces. Do you recall? It steps it's into a fairly high percentage over a period of time, and that's the way we did our 05 study. Um, and and I'm assuming it would operate much like our other garage. Now that's that's because of where it's sited, its location, and that kind of thing. But I, I'd have to look back at the exact percentage. But I, I know it was fairly conservative. And then in our current garage, how many leased spaces do we have now? Yeah, Brett answered these detailed ones. We can't answer them. We'll definitely get them that's, back that's before fine. the council meeting. Uh, yeah, the, the garage is 500, roughly 540 spaces. Uh, I believe that we say we'll take up to 400 lease customers and we try to reserve the rest for hourly. But that number can fluctuate depending on the time of year. Uh, and, and those are round numbers. Uh, it, it might be off by 10 or 15 in either direction, but just to give you an idea. So are leased on more than just that entry off of capital? Yes, we one around the corner. Yeah, the, the, the main lease areas there's levels one and three and four, plus four C, which is the uncovered area on uh, top, and then the PSC, which we alluded to earlier, has lease spaces on level five, which is the uh, upper story uncovered. Uh, that is strictly for the. It, it's associated with the governor office building. The public service commission rents uh, leases those parking spaces. So we've got four hundred leases in there theoretically for everybody. That that is where you know we try to manage it in that in that ballpark. So you know, but we have space available right now. We probably have 350 customers, 360. I haven't looked at my monthly reports lately, but uh, we're in that range. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Well, that that's all we really had. Obviously. Uh, you know, two weeks from now, we can talk some more about this. If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to try to talk talk, talk about those ahead of time. Uh, but uh, hopefully this got people's questions answered. And, and another thing coming up, I know uh, Councilman Fitzwater asked us at the maybe the next public works and planning committee meeting to kind of just go over our parking codes. Uh, and so, you know, kind of get more detailed into that. We can give another presentation at that meeting. But just, you know, why, you know, why is it? You know, I think I try to cover it a little bit, but keeping those nine, you know, maybe 90 minutes, I assume I'm on the right track with this. And when you ask about parking codes, you know, why is it 90 minutes for free where everybody wants to be? And and then versus, you know, we're, we're trying to uh, charge on the side streets and, and those kind of things, a small amount. At least. We can go over that in detail. Councilwoman Wiseman. I, I would like to back up to almost the American Rescue Plan and ask a question about that and parking. Um, so I think Councilman Vote brought up an idea of like the touchless parking meters. Is it, can we enhance our parking through the 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 plan and the dollars that have been spent or the dollars that have been given to us, or is that something we can look into? Because I mean, well, uh, yeah, it was. It's been brought up a couple of times, but the basic answer is, you know, when you charge in a, a small amount for that service, you know, the service provider will take a pretty good chunk of that. So that's one of our three. That's, that's the hurdle. Now, if we had the uh, higher rates, uh, then yeah, that, that's a possibility. Now, you also have to have different meters. You have to have certain cell phone coverages, all those kind of things go into that, but uh, those internet connections and things. So 
there's, there's a little bit of work to get to that. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we also have uh, some public comment. And then since this is a work session, we can certainly interact again after that and have further discussion. But why don't we take up some public comment? We do have with us Mr. Robert Krause uh, signed up to speak. In regard to the property, by the way, I knew. Sure, uh, welcome. Yeah, we would love to have I, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you spoke of the Schmidt apartments earlier, and yes, we have taken very quite a few steps in order to ensure that there's no damage done to those things as well. I mean, to that apartment house. Right. Uh, there seems that's a good point to bring out. Uh, um, it says the central bank slash warehouse. The warehouse is on our property. We're selling the land, basically, and the warehouse happens to be on there. It's square footage in our uh, agreement or in our proposal, the city's proposal. The warehouse will be uh, demolished then. Um, really, that's the only thing I wanted to kind of clear up was that when I read the paper account as well, it seems as though the central bank owns the warehouse, and I just wanted to clear that up as well, unless there's any other questions that someone has of me. We appreciate that, okay. uh, Mr. Grouse, and thank you for being here, and we'll see if council has some questions. Uh, Mr. Just, Councilman just, Fitzwater? Just to piggyback on the councilman's question. Sorry about that. I think the concern related to, I, I think on the report said that there was about a 40 foot elevation difference between Central Bank and McCarty Street. I think the concern was the dirt and rock that's going to come out of that site. I don't know how much that 40 feet we're going to chip off. Are we taking it all the way down to McCarty Street? And I think that's the concern taking that rock out of the hillside. And what to do with it or just the fiscally do it? What it'll do to structures around it. Yeah, and so, sorry about that. No, I, yeah, uh, yeah. so with any uh, project like that, you know, we'll have to have a blasting contractor. They'll have to be certified. Uh, they set up seismographs, things like that. And so they have to manage the the load uh, or the, the uh, construction method to what's around it. And if I could just piggyback onto that, you know, the jail construction was done very similar to that, you, you know, right across the street here. So certainly it's within the means and methods, but no, it doesn't have to go all the way down because you're going to start spiraling up. That first up is going to begin to catch grade quite a bit. It's still going to be a, a significant excavation, but it's not all the way to the McCarty Street level on that backside, which would be adjacent to the, 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 the buildings that we're talking about. Thank you. Any uh, and, and thank you. I would oh, I would point one more thing about that, and, and this is kind of a nuance. And of course, we get into design; all these questions get answered. But the uh, you know we own the the property just across the street and down a little bit on a lot where we used to have. There used to be some houses fronting there, and those all been removed now. Kind of a deep hole, but we have a good, convenient place to put a lot of this fill, short distance. So we'll we'll gain some economy of scale there maybe create some street frame that somebody could do something with as well or more parking or whatever. That raises one additional question. Going down that deep, will we have to put a retaining wall on three sides or do they have ways to secure that? Yeah, basically, bank? yeah, basically the garage will be a retaining wall. If you will. So it'll be designed that way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Krause, for being here this evening. Uh, we realize that this is definitely a partnership that, you know, working together to make it happen. And uh, we appreciate your support of something that would really become an asset for the community. So thank you for taking the time to be here to answer questions as well. Um, is there anyone else here that would like to speak? Welcome. Sitting too long. Jack Deacon, <clears throat> excuse me, 236 South Bluff Street, Jefferson City. I came here originally completely against it because of the location. And uh, my thought was it was being sold strictly as an uptown service with retail. And since there's very little retail, I think there's maybe eight of them in your block, three or four of them in the next block going east. And I think the bridal shop is probably moving. But if it's being sold as an asset for the state, 
for the parking they need. And if it's going to be self-funding, uh, I can definitely see discussion on it. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm for it or against it, but I'm a lot more easily swayed to think maybe the state's going to pay for it and the location. But if the location is for the uptown business district hoping to grow, that's not going to happen. We all know that's the death knell. It's just mainly restaurants and a few <clears throat> Do the retail, but in uh, Mr. Marash, if you wanted to look back in the, wherever Matt is, in the newspaper, it's about the old um, garage. What you'll see is a big discussion and lawsuit from Mr. Don Cure, the original contractor, when he ran into some rock. I guess he didn't have a contingency plan on there, so uh, he lost the city one. But that was the newspaper of the day. If there's any questions, thank you. Any questions? Thank you for thank coming. You. Yes. And anyone else to speak? Welcome. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Welcome. First, let me apologize for the attire. I left rugby practice early to come out. Uh, my name is Angela Nail. I'm with the Downtown Association. I am the secretary. I'm also the um, event planner for Thursday Night Live. I'm on the board for Salute to America and among my real job, uh, the other stuff, so. Um, Downtown Association did provide a letter of recommendation for the um, for the garage, and so I'm sure all of you have read that and obviously know that we are very much in support of this. So our job as the Downtown Association is to benefit our businesses, is to make sure that whether it be paying the city to shovel the, side, the snow off the sidewalk, to make sure that it's pretty, which is why the down Jefferson City was voted most beautiful was most beautiful city in America? Small town. Small town. And that was because we are beautiful and because we take the time to make sure we take care of downtown. Parking is a concern. We do hear from businesses as where they're approaching us asking about empty buildings. Where do we park? Matter of fact, at rugby practice, my other coach is a lobbyist and almost every day she rents a spot behind Subway. And almost every day someone is parking in her spot that she pays for. And then she calls the city, tells them to take care of it, go give them a ticket, and they tell her to go pay to park in the garage. So she has to pay twice to park because there's apparently not a park, enough parking spaces. Someone parks in her spot. So but that's just something I just was just told. You clarify that again. You said that she had the city. She rents a spot behind Subway. She's a lobbyist. Their office is right there next to Subway. Okay. Got that. And then the city, so, st somebody within the city says. Yeah, so she calls, she calls, well, that's. JCPD. I think, I think she's uh, renting a private space. Yes. And so therefore, PD comes by and you you know it has a little sign, observed or whatever. They give the ticket. Yes. And then so she's not a customer of parking. She's a customer yes. of this owner of this private space. Correct. Yes. So but so JCPD comes to ticket her ticket the person that's in her spot. Well, what does she do until then? Well, she has to go find another spot to park. So it just shows that there is a shortage. But we do hear from multiple businesses, people looking at downtown, um, where do our employees park? I know um, Mayor Turgeon has a lot of employees at Hallmark, or her dad has a lot of employees at Hallmark, and where do they park? They pay for metered parking or either in the garage or down on McCarty, and so there's nowhere for them to park either. And so it'd be a lot easier if we actually had a parking garage for our, you know, our employees, whether it be Hallmark, um, yes, the bridal shop, and I beg to differ, we are gonna change the downtown. <laughs> Retail is coming back and we're gonna work our butt off to make sure it happens. And it's working with the chamber, it's working with the city and it's us working together to benefit downtown. It's, we're not dead yet. My mom worked downtown for years at Kaiser's Jewelry. I spent my high school days in downtown Jefferson City, watching the vibrance, watching the businesses, shopping, eating downtown. All my teenage years, I took the city bus when I finally got a job at the mall and went to the mall and came back. I've ate breakfast with Joan Shea Monet since I was 16 years old. And now she is um, in the governor's building. And for her, she'll even say it, parking's an issue for her customers. You know, the ones that actually come in that don't work in that building. Our job is to make sure that our businesses are taken care of. And I would like to think the city would think the same. So it is definitely needed. It is, um, we want, we have so many empty buildings. And, and then like um, Mayor Turgeon said, how do you sell the JCPenney building when there's nowhere for their employees to park? Because they want, one of the proposals was uh, to turn that into an office building. Well, where do all those people park? So they can't park on the street. They do the downtown shuffle. It's every 90 minutes you move. I do that. So, um, but 
Downtown is very much in support. Salute to America. And um, you brought up the point of when there's parades or Salute to America has stuff going on, you can't access that Madison Street garage. So where does everyone go? Actually, most, the majority of them will go down to the Central Bank Financial Center parking lot and walk up that hill. And so if we have that garage there, that allows, you know, the less of a walk for our, our people visiting downtown Jefferson City. So, Thank you, Mrs. Nail. Any um, questions? And I think I'll, I'll interpret just a little bit of our, our speakers tonight. I think there's, there's definitely, this, this shows the benefit of having mixed use. I think that this is definitely the state, and it's a balance between having the state, having the business district, which produces sales tax for the city. It, it's such a mixture between that and tourism and visitors and locals, and it, it truly is, is a, a mixed use uh, potential of collaborative interest there. So uh, appreciate the uh, feedback from, from all of you. Is there anyone else here this evening that is here to speak? Any other council discussion? Uh, Councilman Fitzwater? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify with Mr. Moresh, the one of the comments Mr. Deacon made, and I appreciate his comments, but my understanding is we're presenting this based on our city needs, not what the state needs. There may be some people going to the Capitol that they'd basically be private individuals, right? We have not discussed with the state or have we discussed with the state? No, it, not, it's not. The primary focus isn't the state employees. So it's, it's employees. For, for the city. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and all the spinoff from the legislative or pe activity. private people going to the capital. Yeah. Or, now, that's not to say that the state, if they find it a good location, won't say, well, right. we'd like 20 or 100 space, whatever it is, uh, in that garage and try to come to a lease agreement with the city. But right now, you're... We're not presenting the performance on that. Yeah, we're not as if we're building it for the city and for our needs downtown. Correct. And a lot of those needs are state, like the spinoff from the state, the lobbyists and uh, those uh, people who work in the Capitol and visit the Capitol. And yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, many people who visit. Councilman Spencer? Matt, just real quick. <laughs> Get in your exercise, cardio, hey. yoga, whatever you want to call it. Walk up the hill. Uh, so uh, you're just putting a, a placeholder as far as the number for Madison Street Rehab, right? A mill. Correct. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, that could go up or down. Okay. I mean, is there a way we can get more definitive numbers on that? Uh, I, we really have to do a study on that to, you know, I could guesstimate it. I mean, that's what we did, you know, the million dollars, but it, it seemed like a fairly high number, um, you know, knowing what we've done in other Thank you. And any uh, councilwoman Wiseman? Yes, thank you. Um, and I, this may have been asked before, but um, I wanted to ask that again tonight. Can we do this without the warehouse? No. Why? Uh, again, go back to the efficiency of the garage, trying to keep it as efficient as possible. Um, anything is possible, but if you want an efficient space, and again, I didn't cover it. It's in the uh, in the PowerPoint. I didn't say a lot about it, but you know, building a garage is kind of a multi generational project. I mean, the current one was started in the '60s. We're still living on it today. Uh, so, location, a good location is is a prominent thing you want to look for. Efficiency and, and use, um, and so the the property is in in the budget that we have laid out here is about seven percent of the. I think I had listed there seven percent of the cost, just the properties, uh, versus the ninety-three percent of all the other stuff. And so, uh, backing off of that and building something that isn't as efficient, doesn't work well, it just would be a, not a good idea. And, and, just, and just adding floors on the Madison Street. Yeah. So the other, you know, the other thing is, you know, Madison Street, you know, anything can be done with enough money, of course. Uh, Madison Street is getting of the age. Would you, you know, is that really a smart thing to do? Maybe, uh, uh, you know, but it, it would probably look more like a tear down redo at that point. So, again, very expensive to tear it down and redo it because you're losing all your parking you paid for uh, that still has life left in it. 
I mean, I just that's that's kind of what our working thought was on that. If if that were to happen, actually, it's funny. I, I did like the professor guy, you know, that you know the guy in the industry that comes to the College of Engineering gives the class an assignment and they go over it. One of them was how to redo the Madison Street Garage, and about half the class said it, it would need a tear down and uh, totally revamped uh, if we were to do that to add space to that. So just a one-off note. But again, some positives that it's property we already own. Yeah, it's it's property already owned. But you yeah, know, I gonna... think uh, you know, focusing on the you know, let's call it a million dollars of property. You know, yes, that's a lot of money. However, you know, the attributes of having two different facilities in two different locations, uh, being able to create some of this public space. Uh, you know, and again, forty years from now. I think people would think that was a good decision. I mean, you know, the 2019 appraisal rate versus today, I mean, I, I think that's that's a little concerning too, is that, that we're paying above appraisal for that property. And Correct. You know, even a 20% increase from 2019 to now, you know, there yet, so. What, what, I didn't what, go into it. Uh, the council could condemn the property and, and try to get closer to the appraisal. There's always legal fees and all that. I don't. You know, it's probably in the venue to talk about that kind of thing in, but that's a possibility if you don't like, the, don't like the number, but like the property, I guess. Councilwoman Wiseman. Thank you. Um, this one's for Ryan. Can you remind us what that condemnation process looks like? Sure. Um, overall, I would say it's a six months to one year process, depending on a lot of different things, but essentially, uh, the city would be required to send a 60-day letter, um, and it essentially uh, it gives 60 days notice to the uh, to the property owner that the city is intending to uh, to acquire the property and may do so by condemnation. Um, once that 60-day process passes, then the city has to approve a uh, a bill that uh, authorizes condemnation. Uh, then we go into litigation cases filed. Um, usually within a month or two, the court will assign condemnation commissioners. So it's a panel of three, uh, three people that assign a value to the property. And essentially the, uh, the condemnation commissioners, once they assign that value, the city has to immediately deposit that money into the court or give up on its petition. Um, Either party can then appeal to the circuit court, um, essentially saying that they were unhappy with the condemnation commissioner's uh, uh, praise value, and then take it to a jury. And so the, the whole process can last from, I would say, as, as few as four months, which is lightning fast, um, all the way to uh, probably up to a year and then that's subject to appeals. Uh, appeals can take probably another year on top of that. So it just kind of depends on how contentious it is and what kind of result we have. And, and what, uh, both parties are, are satisfied with either the condemnation commissioner or the trial court, or you know if they think there's some sort of appeal. But I, I would I would say a guess of six to nine months is probably in the right range you know assuming as soon as the city council decided let's go ahead and send out the 60-day letter do you know how those um, condemnation commissioners are are appointed by the court well i guess i should have asked what are what do they have to have certain qualifications do they have to be real estate agents do they have to be lawyers do they no they don't judges? have to be they don't have to be um, real estate agents or lawyers um, they have to have a i believe the the the, the term is a demonstrable um, interest or expertise in in real estate but um you know they the the last set of condemnation commissioners that was used in the Capitol Avenue um, uh, acquisitions included people in the general contracting. I, I believe one of them was a real estate agent, and another one was just, uh, you know, somewhat active in the state development business. Um, so there's not any particular uh, 
beans. It's just kind of someone that the court trusts would have a, you know, a, a reasonably competent uh, amount of experience and knowledge to to perform the task. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? It looks like um, Ms. Nail has a question. Um, I think probably Councilman Wiseman is asking more of the procedural, what the process would be, I believe. What it, what it would look like. It is. Any other questions? Uh, Mr. Deacon? Sure. Excuse me. I have one other thing that um, I've thought about. If we were truly in a parking crunch, the short term, we could look at Jefferson Street and do diagonal parking. I know that made you shudder, but um, we would, and also take away the loading zones because there's really no reason to have the loading zones on Jefferson. I mean, there's nothing there on either corner. You can pick up a lot of spaces, go diagonal on, just on that street only. I mean, Columbia does it on an incredibly busy street on, on Broad, uh, I guess, yeah, it is Broadway. So I think that would work. We, I don't know how many you'd pick up, but that'd be a bunch short term because if we needed that desperately, I mean, why not? Thank you. Mr. Deacon. And I know another point, and I know you mentioned it, Matt, but I uh, just thinking what our both of our speakers had mentioned too, is that uh, when Mr. Deacon brought up the state and other entities that would be paying to or, or state related type business and things, <laughs> That, and I know you touched on it, but the Jefferson parking deck, you know, the waiting list, the fact that we do have a waiting list to get in there that typically doesn't free up ever, you know, so you have 50% of the spaces already potentially leased between that and Central Bank. And so you have that revenue stream already before you've even gone out to sell it. Yeah, before we have any property. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Mr. Krause? We're recording this. Yeah, if you want to come forward in that way, we can hear the perfect. Thank you. And by the way, that is built in. So he was referring to the garage earlier. Um, we're talking a uh, 48,000 something square feet total for, for that parking lot. Is that? I'm just trying to get an idea how broad that the is. Of the square. Site. Of both, yes, of all of it. Sorry. They're recording this, so I got to speak okay. in there that way. I'm sorry. So the, the site we're talking about, Central Bank Warehouse site, total square footage, 140,863 square feet. 140,000 square feet. Oh, well, this, this is times, this is the built square foot, I'm sorry, okay. divide by four, basically. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Right. I have like 15,000 yeah. and, and then they have the rest, correct? About 30 some thousand, 35,000. Was it 48,000 or something like that? I thought. It's 48,000 total. Okay, I was just trying to get a handle on, I wasn't quite sure how large a space we're talking in it, in addition to the property that I'm speaking of. That I, so I, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krause. Any other council discussion before we adjourn? We appreciate everybody's uh, time and the presentation this evening, and we will discuss this further at the next city council meeting. So if you have any further questions, certainly we would ask the public to reach out to your council members if you have further questions or comments there, and also if council members do to send that to staff so we'll have information needed for Monday night. Uh, on that note, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. All right, we are adjourned. Everybody have a great